Queen Mary University of London, where he's Professor of Mathematics and Astronomy. And he's going to talk about the impact on astronomy of Maxwell's Adams Prize essay. Thank you, President, and thank you uh, for the organisers for inviting me here to talk about uh, Maxwell's contribution to planetary science. Uh, I first became aware of Maxwell probably in my first year at university, not because I did, uh, uh, I looked at Maxwell's equations, but because I found this wonderful book on collection of writings from Scientific American. Uh, so this was published in 1968, and there was a a lovely chapter about, about Maxwell, and I learned lots of things, including, and you should look this up, his study habits when he was an undergraduate, um, some drawings he made when he was a child. Uh, but what fascinated me most, I guess, was the, uh, his work on the uh, structure and stability of Saturn's rings, because I found this collection of figures all taken from his Adams Prize essay, and I was just fascinated by it, and, and I kind of recognized Saturn's this plan of Saturn's rings up there, but in amongst all these, these diagrams, uh, this, these were just hieroglyphics to me, but I, I kind of saw a sort of mechanical device. And now, as you've heard from earlier speakers, Maxwell was fascinated by these mechanical devices, uh, um, but it, it just didn't make any sense to me. Now, I, one thing that helped was, first of all, Voyager spacecraft passed Saturn in uh, 1980 and 81, and we saw firsthand what the rings actually looked like. And there was a, a lovely book I'd recommend if you're interested in the, in the subject. Uh, this was published uh, by MIT Press in 1983 by Brush et al., Maxwell on Saturn's Rings. And it's a, uh, it, it not only contains a, a reprint of the actual Adams Prize essay, it also contains uh, the origin of the, the, the essay subject, correspondence between the organizers, uh, and also lots of information about the reaction of the community to what Maxwell had actually done. So, here is reprinted from the, the Brush et al. book the subject of the, the essay that had been decided by actually Chalice and Thompson, uh, the motion of Saturn's rings. And you could suppose that they're rigid, that they're fluid, uh, or they consist of masses of matter not mutually coherent. And the, the task was the question would be considered to be answered by ascertaining on these hypotheses severally. So this is what Maxwell set about to do. Um, I should point out at the time, uh, nobody really believed that the rings were solid. Laplace had done some, some work on this, not really satisfactorily, but uh, people didn't think they were solid. But there was a general consensus, I believe, that the, the rings were, were fluid. And of course, what Maxwell showed is that they cannot be solid, they cannot be fluid. But he started to look at the possibility of that they were composed of individual particles. And he, he set up um, several uh, systems of, of rings, starting off with, with one ring, with uh, equally massed satellites positioned around the ring. And he did what we kind of recognize now as a classical uh, linear stability analysis. He linearized the equations of motion. Um, an eigenvalue problem looked at the, the, the eigenvalues and was looking for the sort of classical purely imaginary facilitary. Um, but he, he, he nicely broke it up into a radial, tangential, and normal displacement. So, and you can sort of see the, the, the logic in this, that if here's your displaced uh, satellite, one of the equal mass ones. And if you displace it radially, you can realize that they're, um, that's probably stable because the, the forces of, of attraction for the, the nearby ones are going to force it back. Um, the normal displacement, the same, if you're just looking edge on the, the rings, that would be, seem to be logical. But the tangential displacement at first glance looked look difficult because as you displace it in the tangential direction, uh, you, you obviously then increase the, the force of attraction to the, the nearest satellite. Um, but of course, the whole thing is actually rotating, and this is an important subject, uh, because this changes the whole nature of it. And what uh, Maxwell showed was the normal displacement we don't have to worry about, but there's a nice coupling between the radial and the tangential displacement. And this actually goes to, to show why if you're, um, let's say, in a spacecraft orbiting the Earth and you want to, to move to an outer orbit, um, your instinct tells you apply a radial force, but in reality you apply a tangential force. And, and I suspect Maxwell knew that knew that very well. Um, so he looked at these, these system of, of, of rings, and in fact, he, uh, he uh, described four types of wave solution. 
to the, to the problem of these equal mass satellites. Now, the number of satellites are around the, the, the ring and their, their distribution isn't, isn't that important, but the fact that these types of waves, the most important were the type 1 and type 4, um, the, the satellites that make up the ring are rotating in this direction, um, and with this type 1 wave, you get motion of the wave around like this, whereas for the type 4 wave, it's in the, the reverse direction. Uh, he also looked at, um, when he realized that you could have these stable modes, uh, that these, you would need to think, because the rings aren't just composed of, of, of one ring of satellites, but, but many, he looked at the interaction between two rings and how uh, the, the oscillations in one would be affected by, by the, the other. And he did this uh, in rather nice analysis. Um, but then we come to the, these, these drawings. And again, it clearly now just typifies Maxwell, because these are the drawings from, from the, the, the prize-winning essay. And he, he wrote this to, to his colleague, um, Lewis Campbell, at the end of 1857. I've devised a machine to exhibit the motions of the satellites in a disturbed ring. And Ramage is making it for the edification of this phrase, sensible image worshippers. Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think my instinct, as you probably realize, is that, that Maxwell was, was a master of outreach and kind of wanted to, to help visualize the, these, these things. But I also love this kind of follow-up letter to, to Campbell. Um, I've got a very neat model of my theoretical ring, a credit to Aberdeen workmen. I'm sure they're still as good as they ever were in Aberdeen. And I was amazed when I, when I read that the model still existed and was, of course, in the Cavendish. I should have come to Malcolm in the first place, but I was informed that the, the model was there and in the Cavendish. I wanted to go there, contacted Malcolm. He said, well, I actually have a video of it, and he's kindly supplied me with the, the video, so courtesy of Malcolm Longer and the Cavendish Laboratory. So this is the device that um, was actually created. So you have these brass rings, these connecting rods. These are little balls of ivory around the outside. And this is sort of a crank at the, at the back that you, you, can, you can turn to illustrate the, the various types of, of motion. And uh, we can actually see this in operation. I find this absolutely fascinating. So this is one where you get uh, seven maxima and seven minima as you go around. And the wave, I think, is, the, is kind of propagating in, in this, this direction. And I, I find this absolutely fascinating. I've watched, watched this for hours. Um, <laughs> So the fact that this model exists, and, and Malcolm assures me that you can go to, to the Cavendish Laboratory and, and ask to, to see it, and it is actually on display. So here's the, the title page from the essay. And it, was, it was reprinted in 1859. Maxwell cha changed a few things. But he, he, his conclusion was the final result, therefore, of the mechanical theory is that the only system of rings which can exist in one composed of an indefinite number of unconnected particles revolving around the planet with different velocities according to the respective distance. So this was the, the general result. And it, it's fair to say that that, that is, um, in terms of, of legacy, something we still take for granted today. Because I, I will tell you now, we still don't have a, a high resolution image of Saturn's rings that shows the individual particles. But there's nobody that I know of who doesn't believe Maxwell's results for the theoretical basis. Um, Airy, the astronomer mm -hmm. at the time, wrote a, uh, a summary of Maxwell's work in, in the monthly notices and said, uh, um, it's placed on a footing, Saturn's rings, totally different from any that it has occupied before, that the essay which we have abstracted is one of the most remarkable contributions to mechanical astronomy that appears for, for many years. So this was uh, published in 1859, the, the same year as the, the essay was, was, was published. Um, so I was asked to talk about the impact of, of Maxwell's essay. Um, well, it's fair to say that, uh, as with all great discoveries, the immediate impact was, was practically nil. Um, John Herschel ignored it. Uh, he had already had a, a, a text on outlines of astronomy, I think it had been published since the 1840s. Didn't mention it, even though he had, had the opportunity to do so with subsequent editions. The American astronomer Benjamin, Benjamin Pierce, I think it was the, the first paper ever published in an astronomical journal, uh, volume 1, page 1, didn't mention it in his work on Saturn's rings uh, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, this was admittedly only, only a few years later. Um, but but the, the ultimate insult was 1872 when the French astronomer Gustave Adolphe Hirn, he didn't mention it in his presentation to the Paris Academy of Sciences. 
And whether it's because of sort of uh, uh, Anglo-French uh, history, if you remember that Airy was involved in, and Adams as well, um, Adams felt he had to step in at this stage and actually contacted Hearn to, to essentially complain that the, the result that he derived had already been derived by, by Maxwell more than, more than 10 years earlier. And um, Hearn gave an excuse that we probably all recognize today. He said it's most easily explained by the difficulty that even the most active scientists <laughs> of today to keep themselves up to date with the very numerous publications in scientific literature, whatever their value. And I think um, we'd all recognize that. Um, so the real legacy did take place because the, the impact was there. James Keeler was the, the first person to do spectroscopic observations of, of Saturn's rings. And this is from his, his, his paper of, of 1895 in the Astronomical Journal where he actually says uh, that the theory proposed by Maxwell had been firmly established. And so what, what Keeler did was actually do the spectroscopic observations, realizing that there would be um, a Doppler shift. So if this is the east answer and the west answer, uh, the east answer, the Doppler shift would be, would be blue shifted, and on the right answer, it would be red shifted. And indeed, the spectroscopic observations confirmed that, as indeed we, we, we all expected. So now let's jump forward 110 years ago. We now have a spacecraft in orbit uh, around Saturn. This is the, the Cassini spacecraft. Um, so I'm on the imaging team for, the, for the, the cameras there, and I've been working this mission now for, for about 25 years. Uh, and this is the view we have of, of Saturn's rings today. Uh, we have the, the A and B rings that were known in Maxwell's time, the C ring which had just been discovered, but we know also that there's a, a D ring and there's a very faint F ring. There's also a G and, and E rings outside. And then comparing that with Maxwell's uh, diagram showing the A and B, so this was in his, his, his paper and the recently discovered dark ring, as they call it, the, the, the C ring. Now, just some, some facts about the Saturn's ring system. We know that it's the largest planetary ring system, both in terms of mass and, and volume. We know that it's composed of particles, the emphasis on, on particles of water ice, even though we've never seen individual particles. Uh, mostly water ice, at least 90% pure water ice, maybe 95, with some impurities. Typical particle size is a collisional distribution, so uh, there's a, obviously a range of sizes, but typically, let's say, in the A-ring, about a centimeter in size. We still don't know the origin. Um, there are theories that you'd need to break up a giant comet, because if you put all the mass together, you'd get something of the order of the size of 200, 200 maybe 300 kilometer size satellite, an icy satellite, and so it has to be a giant comet. But there's a question. I mean, remember, the, the, it was the stability of motion of Saturn's rings that Maxwell was trying to, to solve with the essay. Um, we still have the same problem today. Maybe the time scales have changed. But as best we can tell, the age of the rings is about 200 million years, which is an uncomfortably small fraction of the, the age of the solar system. And so we have to say either we're missing something or the rings come and go. But it's a time scale problem. And one of the, the missing uh, parameters we need is the mass of the rings or something we're working on. Now, Maxwell talked about the, the rings having a thickness of 100 miles. He, he wasn't that far out. It's actually 10 meters, is what we now believe. Uh, here's the Cassini division between the A and B ring. So here's the, the B ring in here, the C ring, the A ring. Now, I just keep the pointer on the Cassini division as we go from below to above the, the ring plane. I've not done any trickery. This is the Cassini division. You can see the material in it. The B ring is almost opaque. And you can just start to see the C ring appear in here. The A ring looks more or less the same. Um, th this can be explained in terms of, of particle size and the different viewing geometry as we go from below to above. There are only a very few uh, gaps in the rings. There's a, there's tiny gaps in the Cassini division, and there's a lot of material as well. There's the Anka gap there and the Keeler gap. Uh, a beautiful illustration, I think, is uh, here's the Keeler gap, obviously named after James Keeler for his work on Saturn's rings. It has, contains a, a small satellite which has been named Daphnis which orbits in the gap. This is about 30 kilometers wide. And you can see the beautiful pattern that it, that it uh, produces. And of course, this is a wake pattern, and you get it on either side. And it's not like a, the first analogy is with a boat going across a lake, and you produce a wake that kind of follows the, the boat. The wake that Daphnis produces does, does follow its, its, its motion. But it's rather odd in that it goes on one side, um, it kind of leads, and the other side it trails. And the explanation, of course, would, would have been obvious to Maxwell straight away. It's that you've got differential motion. Remember, he talked about different velocities according to the respective distance. This is just a Bain-Kepler's third law. So there is Daphnis right there. 
The particles inside are moving faster than Daphnis, so they're catching it up. They get perturbed. And you can see the, the what are called edge waves here, produced by, by the perturbation. Um, the particles outside are moving slower, so Daph Daphnis is meeting them head on. And uh, there's the wave that's produced downstream because of the, the interaction. Again, Maxwell would have appreciated this. Here's our view of, of Saturn's rings. Uh, this is a mosaic of Cassini ISS images. So we're going from sort of 60,000 kilometers of the sort of cloud tops over here out to about 137,000 kilometers. But I, I wanted to concentrate on this region. So this is about 8 to 10,000 kilometers across because uh, this was a discovery by the Voyager spacecraft. There's the Maxwell Gap in the middle of the rings. Um, it's as large almost as the, the Enca Gap in the, in the A ring. There's the Keeler Gap for comparison, much larger than the Keeler Gap. Uh, and it's a classic gap in the rings. There are not many gaps in the rings. Um, there was a lot of talk in the press when the Voyager images came back about thousands of rings. That implies a ring and a gap and a ring and a gap. That's not the case. There are actually very few gaps. And we know this from occultation data. So this is the Cassini radio science experiment where you use the, the radio transmitter and the spacecraft to, um, uh, passing the radio waves through the rings and then being picked up on, on the ground. Um, so here's the Maxwell gap. Um, but there's also a Bond gap and a, and a Dawes gap as well in, in, in the C-ring from the occultation profiles. And this is one of the most beautiful images. This is the Maxwell gap showing uh, a ringlet in the middle of the gap. It's one of these misnomers, which is actually quite frequent in the rings. The gaps actually tend to have either a satellite in the case of Pan and, and the anchor gap, or actually a ring in the middle of the gap. And this ring uh, again would have really appealed to, to Maxwell because it's, it's, it's rather special. Um, it's actually precessing uniformly. Now, th that means that it's as if it was solid. Of course, one of the hypotheses that, that Maxwell had, had uh, d discounted uh, because uh, the inner edge, which is elliptical, and the outer edge, which is also elliptical, should be precessing under Saturn's oblateness at exactly the same, uh, at different rates, with the inner processing faster. So there should be differential precession. But it doesn't. It precesses as if it was completely uniform. And the explanation is, and this was just theories developed by Ordery, Skolreich, and Tremaine in the, in the late 80s, is actually exhibiting what's called an m equals 1 normal mode. So there's actually a, a spontaneously set up in the ring, the optical depth is thick enough and the particle density uh, uh, large enough, you get these spontaneous uh, density waves set up, and they actually bounce off the outer edge and the inner edge, and you get this, uh, this, this beautiful wave set up. And this is a, an M equals 1 ring, and it's what the, the, the Brush et al. book calls a semi-rigid ring. Again, Maxwell would appreciate this, this, this perfectly. And we actually know of other examples in other ring systems. Uh, this is, uh, we know there's an M equals 0 in the Uranus ring, M equals 2, which is actually a centered ellipse, not a Keplerian ellipse in the at the edge of the B ring, or also in the Uranian rings. Uh, we know there's a, a, there's a profile you can start of the, of the Maxwell ringlet itself, showing the uh, evidence of, of waves. An incredible system. But what do real, the real rings look like? Now, this is a numerical simulation. This is from work by, by Haki Salo that shows the effect of self-gravity in the rings and the orbital motion is to produce these, these kind of structures that are canted to the Keplerian direction and uh, are, are temporary in nature. So we, we're pretty sure these exist. Here's the proverbial artist's impression, but this is probably quite accurate. Uh, we know this. Again, we've never seen these in the sense we have images of these, but the ground-based uh, and uh, uh, space-based occultations show that this is the case. The other thing affecting the rings are orbital resonance. So this is an external forcing that actually has lots of similarities with these m equals 1, m equals 2 modes, and, and so on. So these are the, the resonant locations in the rings, and I've exaggerated the, the, the spiral nature of these. Uh, they're much more tightly wound than that. And if you look in the rings, this is actually one we took at Saturn Orbit Insertion back in 2004. So MEMIS 5 to 3 bending wave actually causes corrugations in the rings. And that's uh, over here, and this is a density wave. And every uh, structure you see here can be explained in terms of these, these density waves. And so if you look at the... Um, uh, what you would have for, and this would be an M equals 7 mode, again, the similar terminology to what we have in the, in the Maxwell ringlet, you would get uh, these seven lobes. So these would be the streamlines of the particles. And it's this kind of bunching and um, sort of compression rarefaction that, 
causes the, 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 the waves to develop around them. Now, the beauty of this is that this is predicted to exist at the edge of the, of the A-ring. So this is a movie we, we designed at, at Queen Mary of 194 images. Actually, we're interested in the F-ring, but we, for good measure, we get the, the, the A-ring. There's the Keeler gap. There's the, the Enka gap. And we can put all this together. And uh, this is not 360. This is a 300-kilometer scale. And we see this is about a 30-kilometer from minimum to maximum. Uh, along the, the edge of the A-ring. It's more complicated because the moon that's causing it, Janus, is actually in a resonance itself and swaps position uh, every four years. But, uh, of course, there's another way of presenting this, which is to do a nice polar projection. So that's Cassini's view of the edge of the A-ring. And obviously, it's all just e exaggerated, but this is based on real data, 194 individuals, images, 2007. And uh, exactly 150 years earlier, that's a figure from Maxwell's work. Now, I, I have to state that Maxwell, um, it was a completely different process, but the fact that you get these waves on the, on the ring, uh, Maxwell would have certainly, would have certainly appreciated. So I wanted to, to end with this amazing picture of the, the rings to, taken by Cassini. And remember, we still have this stability problem. We still have lots of things to explain about, about the rings. Um, but I wanted to finish with a quote that's in the, the introduction to, to the essay, which he says, we've actually seen that great arch swung over the equator of the planet without any visible connection. We cannot bring our minds to rest. We must either explain its motion on the principles of mechanics or admit that in the Saturnian realms there can be motion regulated by laws that we are unable to explain. So um, that is, is uh, what we live by when we're trying to explain all the structure we're, we're seeing in Saturn's rings. And um, I wish James Clark Maxwell had been around to see what we found. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Beautiful photographs of the rings. They're gorgeous. So, opportunity for some questions or comments. I see a hand in the third row, middle of the third row, fourth row, depending how we count. Keep your hand up, sir, in the middle of this row. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Cox, in his uh, television show, Wonders of the Soul, Soul System, um, suggested that at least part of, some of the ice particles were derived from the moon Encephalus, uh, which has believed to have a notion of water, liquid water within it, and that ice from that, through cracks in its surface, were incorporated and end up in, in the rings of Saturn to, com to comprise some of them at least. Um, that, that's perfectly true, but in the Enceladus is, is outside the main ring system, and the material that comes from Enceladus uh, produces the E-ring, which is a very diffuse ring that was discovered from ground being observations in, in 1980 at actually ring plane crossing. Uh, so yes, the, um, uh, the non-gravitational forces on those ring particles, because they get charged, is sufficient for some of them to come into the to inner part of the rings, but that's not, they're not adding much to the mass, and so it's, uh, it, it's, it's slightly misleading to, to discuss them. It's an excellent story. I, I, was, in, I was in that ep episode on, um, on Saturn's rings and, uh, and Enceladus, so uh, uh, you, you can see me taking Brian through JPL and, and the, um, the Deep Space Network and, and so on, talking about, about Saturn's rings. So. But yes, he remember he identified this as one of the wonders of the solar system, which is definitely true. Thank you. Yes, center. Uh, um, you showed at the end that the, the resonance is actually observed. But what was it? What was it? Maxwell was what observation was Maxwell actually trying to explain? I mean, it, I, 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 I just, it wasn't the differentiation of the rings. Or, um, or did there, it there bear was, on that? There was some suggestion that the, the rings had structure apart from the, the A, B, and, and, and C. Um, and I think uh, we knew about the association of the, the outer edge of the B ring with uh, there's a resonance with, with Mimas. It's actually a, an M equals 2, so it's a center of ellipse in outline. The main thing he was trying to explain was the, the stability, you know, because there were still people who thought it was, it was fluid or, or, or solid, and he was able to show on mathematical principles that that is not the case. It has to be composed of individual particles. 
So he didn't know about the kind of resonance structure, obviously, that, that, that came with, with Voyager and, and much later. But it was the stability of the rings, which, as I said, is something we're actually still trying to, to deal with in, in a different context. Um, I may have heard you, but I think you said that 90% of this is particles of water ice. That's correct. And then you say that it may have come from the breakup of a planet. That planet I, presumably wasn't 90% water ice. No, I didn't say, I said, I didn't say a planet, I said a, a giant comet or a satellite, or maybe I said planet by accident. Then. Okay, okay. okay. Um, Are you implying that therefore that yeah. the, all the residue of that breakup would be in the ring? Or you're suggesting there's some no, segregation the, um, of, the other, of the other material? The, the person who, who's done most work on this recently is Robin Canop. And she's proposing that there were, there were Titan-sized objects, Titan be the largest moon of Saturn, uh, in, in the past. And that uh, some of them, the ones that formed inside synchronous orbit, would actually evolve tidally inwards and would be broken up uh, by the tidal forces. And her idea was that the, the kind of rocky core of those objects would be absorbed by Saturn and the icy mantle would, would remain, which kind of neatly gets around the fact that the rings are all icy. But there are icy moons of, of Saturn anyway, like, like Enceladus, for example. It's basically an icy object, and therefore you kind of make the connection. You look, where do you find other icy objects in the solar system, hence giant comets or, or satellites. I'm going to stop the questions there. We've got a long lunch break coming up, and there'll be opportunity to talk. Uh, but I would like to keep us sort of on schedule. Thank you very much indeed, Carl. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you.